so guys, and thanks so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs all the way from Brooklyn, New York. You are a psychotherapist and researcher, but you also speak out and raise awareness about what it's like to grow up in and then exit an ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Jewish community. So how are you doing, Pesach? What kind of day is it today in Brooklyn, New York? Hi, Mark. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a big fan of Talk Beliefs. Thanks for having Thank me. Today is actually a pretty kind of, I guess, UK type weather or the stereotype of it. Um, oh, it's no. in the low, low 30s Fahrenheit and uh, it's kind of rainy and muggy. A perfect day to stay indoors, snuggle up and, and talk to Mark and talk beliefs. <laughs> Happy to be here. Well, you were born in New York in 1985 into an Orthodox environment. Now, for anyone who isn't quite sure, can you explain what is meant by an Orthodox Jew and more specifically, an Hasidic Jew? Orthodox Judaism is, I guess, a broad umbrella term um, for what's considered Jews that are, I guess, classically observant religious um, or a bit more on the traditional side. Hmm. So to briefly summarize, most Jews in this world, most people who identify as Jewish um, are not Orthodox Jewish people. Um, they are more, if you, if you would put them on the spectrum, they are more, they're closer to cultural um, or secular um, mm -hmm. and more mo mo modern, mo modernized. For example, I'm Jewish, um, but if, I'm, if I walk on the street, um, you know, the, the image of what people think when, when they think of a Jewish person would not pop into their head. Um, most Jews sort of present like this. And something like 10 to 30 percent, I don't know exactly how much, um, are, would fall under the umbrella of Orthodox, which is all the way to the right end of the spectrum. Now, what's the most stripped down version of what's considered Orthodox Jew, um, and there is some consensus about this, according to the Orthodox Jews, is somebody who sort of follows these three tenets. Um, number one is they are, they, they are observant of the Sabbath. Um, number two is they are observant of kosher dietary rules. And number three, they are observant of, I guess, family purity laws. And that's sort of the main skeleton ingredient of, of, of what we define or what some define as an Orthodox Jew. And that is the minority of people who identify as Jewish. Within Orthodox Judaism, there is a, another massive subspectrum, um, all the way from the most fundamentalist fanatical to a bit more what we call modern Orthodox, um, who mm. try to sort of fuse, you know, tradition and modernity. Um, so let's go all the way to the right of the spectrum. You would have sort of Almost all the way to the right, you would have Haredi Jews. Um, another way for Hare to say Haredi is sort of a more newer term is ultra-Orthodox. Um, and they are, I guess, the, the most strict or most fundamentalist in, in the way they navigate Orthodox Judaism. Uh, under Haredi or ultra-Orthodox Judaism, there are multiple categories too. So you have Hasidic, you have Litvish, and you have... <clears throat> what's now a third category, which is Chabad. Um, mm. But I grew up Hasidic, which is under Haredi. And even within Hasidic Judaism, um, especially nowadays and always, is, there's another massive subspectrum. Um, so when you speak to each individual Hasidic person or each individual former Hasidic person, you'll get a bit of nuance and, and different flavors of what it was like to grow up, depending on their geography, depending on their particular sect, depending on their family, um, depending which schools they went to. Um, so there's a nice sort of diversity in it, um, but it doesn't sort of look that way from the outside. Um, from the outside, it, it, it all looks like one big thing. Um, mm. And I, I grew up in such a community, um, Hasidic faith community in Bar Park, which is a, a neighborhood in, in Brooklyn, New York, in the United States. Um, and it was called Babav. It is called Babav. Um, B-O-B-O-V, and its origin um, is in Europe, um, somewhere, I don't remember the exact year, but it's actually not that old. Um, it originated, uh, you know, pre-World War II, and it's 
eventually post-Holocaust, you know, migrated to, to the States. Um, and there's branches all over the world for this particular sect, but its main um, space, what I call the Mecca of it, is, is in Bar Park. And, and that's where I grew up. So let's go back to the beginning. You grew up in this very fundamentalist, insular Jewish sect. So what's your background and what was it like for you as a small child to grow up in this environment? So I did grow up in a quite insular faith community. And th there is so much, you know, argument or conversation coming from both people who are still in it and both people who've left or somewhere in the middle exactly how to package um, this experience, um, the language we use. But I'm just going to speak from my experience. So what was it like uh, growing up in Baba? Um, it was looking back, if I think about it as objectively as possible, and obviously stuff is way more complex. This is not some caricature. Um, it was very insulated, um, from sheltered from the world, um, quite fundamentalist, you know, taken the Torah and all its uh, sort of adjacent rules quite literally um, for the most part quite authoritarian, so very controlling, um, highly structured. You know, it's like every step of the day um, had sort of, this is what you do now. <laughs> um, highly demanding um, and sort of very tight knit, okay? A bit of a vacuum. <laughs> you, you know, we were, we were nested in New York City, um, so it's kind of wild when I think about it, that we were nested in one of the biggest urban environments in the world. Um, but but it, did, it didn't quite feel like it all the time. It felt like we were in our own universe, um, in, in our own reality. And life is governed by rules about everything. Um, you know, there's rules around food. Um, there's rules around education. There's rules around clothing. Um, there's rules about relationships, um, especially intergendered relationships. There's so many rituals. Um, there's endless amounts of rules around sexuality. And nearly everything under the sun um, has rules, regulations, endlessly. Um, opportunities for personal choice um, are extremely limited. You sort of a cog in a bigger machine, so to speak. Um, and things that are forbidden on the books are things such as access to non-Hasidic media, um, books that aren't Hasidic, uh, education that's not Hasidic, television, films, music, technology. Even Jews that aren't Orthodox um, are sort of a bit frowned upon. Forget about, you know, non-Jewish folks. Being in touch or having access to any of these things that I mentioned is emphatically discouraged. Um, the learning of sciences and languages um, other than Yiddish um, or Hebrew and any type of literature that's not Hasidic is on the books extremely prohibited. Um, there's strict rigid gender segregation and gender roles. Um, a lot of these things may have, in some sects, become even stricter or maybe loosened up since I've left. It's been a long time, um, but these are sort of the broad rules. Um, birth control is technically prohibited, um, so you sort of have sex just to procreate. Marriages are arranged and, and they occur really early, starting at 18 and sometimes way too often, even younger, and they're arranged. And the dominant language where I come from is Yiddish. Um, so everybody sort of has some grasp of some English, maybe, depending on the degree. Um, but the mother tongue is Yiddish um, and very socially controlling. This is what you do. This is how you think. This is what you feel. This is how you act. This is how you carry yourself. This is what you eat. It's just the endless, endless sort of external manifesto of how to be a person. But um, it didn't seem weird to you, did it? It seemed normal to you as a small child. For the most part. Um, the, you know, the, my humanness leaked through here and there, and I'm very mm -hmm. curious about this and how it happens for everyone. So questions popped up. Things were sort of poking at it inside of me. But generally speaking, you know, if you're zooming out, this is what I knew. Um, this was life. Um, sometimes it was working, sometimes it wasn't, uh, but I didn't have sort of major, major existential um, conflicts as a child. Things weren't always great, and, and there was a lot of stuff that, that didn't seem right or didn't go well. Um, I did, there's a lot of things that, are, that were off about it, but it didn't occur to me that there's something systemically off mm -hmm. um, about this thing. 
Well, 13 is a very significant age for a Jewish boy. So talk us through this time of your life. Why is this age considered such a milestone? And what did you hope that this stage in your life would bring about for you? In Judaism, um, and even more so in Orthodox Judaism, 13 um, for boys is when you are considered a, I guess, spiritual adult. Um, for, for women, um, for girls, it's 12. And when, when you're a kid, you, you, you sort of with the program, right? You have to do what you got to do. You know, you're, you're not, not an observant Jew, um, but it's a bit of a dial down version of it. Um, you are considered, I guess, a spiritual minor. Um, so things are a bit more lenient. Um, for example, if there is a fast day like Yom Kippur, the adults have to fast, you know, the entire thing. Um, but children and some other demographics who are considered vulnerable only have to do it half a day or something like that, right? So you have a bit more leniency. You are treated with kid gloves, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But when you turn 13, I don't know the exact accurate, you know, sort of source where this comes from or every detail involved in it. It's been a while since I've read or learned any of these things. Um, but when you're 13, it's sort of you are now a big boy. Um, you are just like dad in terms of your level of observance. One day to the next, <laughs> um, you, you are considered fully on board. You got to do everything in terms of like what we call a high demand faith, that entire sort of concoction of demands you are signed up on um, when you turn 13 years old as a boy. Your dress code changes um, to, to be more similar to, to your, your dad and, and other male mm -hmm. adults. And it's, it's, it's kind of, it kind of looks funny if you think about it aesthetically. Um, you have like miniature adults walking around, you know, so they, they look like children still, 12, 13 years old, but the outfit is adulty and they, they're doing adult things. They're sort of participating in Jewish life to the full, to the full degree that adults do. So as a child, there were good parts, bad parts, just trying to go through it, you know, let's move through this thing. And... But I always sort of had this feeling that something's off and I'm not doing it right or it's not good enough. Um, like th there's another level th that I have to tap into. So something that uh, I'm thinking about as I'm sharing, something that's sort of very built in um, to, to these types of systems, some people call fundamentalism, but more so psychologically, a very black and white um, you know, view of things. That life is not sort of a process that's messy, things are, we were able to contain things and control them, um, and they're one-dimensional, and I guess that's what fueled this type of thinking, that when I, when I turn 13 or 14, I mean, when I become bar mitzvah, I'll be able to sort of start from scratch, um, get a clean slate, and just try to do this thing as perfectly as possible. Um, and it worked for a while, honestly. Um, for about a year or two, I was really with the program. Um, I was really pious, um, really observant, really immersed. You know, every message that I've got um, from my parents, from my siblings, from my peers, from the religion, from the community, I, I employed. Um, I was like, I figured out this manifesto. I'm going to do it perfectly. I'm going to be exactly like you know, the, the people that are considered to be doing this well. Mm. And, you know, as we all know, for er, not for everyone, for many people, this doesn't sustain. It's not, it's sort of super incompatible with, with humanness, with what it feels like to be a human being. Um, and it, it really surprises me when it doesn't look that way, when it looks like some people are able to pull it off. Um, but I can only speak for myself. It, it did not. You know, it was almost like, how you would phrase a, you know, unfavorable pattern of behavior or maybe an addiction um, is the type of relationship I developed with this thing, right? Um, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to do this perfectly. It didn't work eventually because you can't control your thoughts, feelings, and say you can't control your humanness. Um, and in my head, it was all or nothing. Um, so I, I sort of relapsed and, you know, 
stopped caring and then I turned it on again and tried to do it perfectly. There's this major tug of war um, mm -hmm. with this thing. Am I on? Am I off? Am I on? And am I off? And the process underneath it psychologically was extremely, extremely unhealthy and taxing. And all throughout my teens, I guess I sort of flipped in and out of this thing. Tried to make it work, it didn't. Tried to make it work, it didn't. It's possible in hindsight that if somebody had given me or helped me um, figure out a different way to, to navigate this thing or create a healthier relationship with it, I, I might have still been in there. But this sort of ingredient that I used <laughs> to try to make this thing work, um, it, it just did not unfold. Um, and it just caused me to suffer. Um, Seems like a lot of stress for a, a young teenager to go through. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, everything that I'm sharing is sort of happening inside of me. Um, it, people are only getting the sort of tip of the iceberg and how it's presenting. Um, and But for me, it's, it, there's, you know, the, the, the Third World War is happening inside of me. Um, trying to make this thing work, not not even know what is happening or how to think about it or how to talk about it or process mm -hmm. it or look at it from a different perspective, right? The, the way I'm talking about this now is decades in hindsight, but at the time it was the most debilitating, disorienting experience. Yeah, um, obviously, you know, resulting in episodes and years of anxiety, depression, and, and all that not so fun stuff. Well, at 14, you decided you wanted to go to Israel for a kind of boot camp for Jewish teens. So what was that like? And did it fulfill your expectations? It's it's funny that I refer to it, Mark, um, and you refer to it as a boot camp right now. I guess <laughs> that's what it felt like. So I, I use those words. Um, it's what we call a, a school is called the yeshiva, specifically for boys mm -hmm. and men. Um, and it's kind of customary. Um, that some percentage of boys or teenagers will, will go study abroad. Um, it's sort of a spiritual, you know, venture. <laughs> um, I don't know exactly what motivated me when I was 14. Maybe I wanted to get the heck out of my house. Um, maybe I was hoping that this is going to be the key to, to the perfection, you know, to this time it's going to work. <laughs> um, there was a multiplicity of motivations. Um, but I, I somehow managed to convince my, my really anxious parents to, to let me go away when I was 14 um, to, to Israel, um, to a yeshiva that was part of my sect of Baba. There was one in London. There's many branches in the world. And this is one of the famous ones in Israel, in a city called Bayam, um, where some people send their boys and adolescents to yeshiva. So I'm going to Israel when I'm 14 and a half. I'm on a plane for the first time in my life. Um, and something happened very somatically or experientially, um, I felt freer. It could have been leaving a very strict home. Um, it could have been, it, it was a billion different things, um, but something sh pivoted. Um, I was watching the first movie in my life, the first film on this airplane. Things started to happen. Leaving and, the bubble. Yeah, leaving the bubble. Exposure um, in a very, very different way. Right, I'm not just seeing a newspaper here and there. I'm not just, you know, in the periphery of my eye seeing something. This is like really experiential. I'm going to an airport. I'm on a plane. I'm alone. Nobody, no parents around me. People around me, you know, people that don't look like me. Mixed genders. Um, movies playing. A lot of like a secular environment. Something started to shift. But still, in my mind, there was this sort of plan you know, overarching that I'm going to make this thing work here. But while this is happening, something else is happening. So a part of me is starting to change in very tangible ways every day um, and opening up to the world. And another part of me is feeling really terrible about it um, and telling itself that we're, we're going to start from scratch again. We're, we're going to do this. We're going to beg God for forgiveness. We're going to do this again. Um, and I'm headed to Israel. Over there, the struggle became much harder. You know, I, it was hard for me to accept at the time, and I didn't want to accept it, but this sort of trying to turn this thing on and doing perfectly never lasted for more than a day or a week. You know, whereas before, 
it had long phases. You know, it was good for months, good for a year. And once I was there, this this thing was even less and less sustainable. And from 14 to 17, I was there, and we would come home, you know, sort of every half a year um, for a month or a few weeks. And I would try to make this thing happen over and over again. So there's this two parts of me. One is trying to, you know, move into the world and can't help itself. You know, it wasn't something that was intentional. You know, I just I was just doing it, drawn to it. And the other half is trying to pull it back in. Yeah, we got to try this thing again. And back and forth and back and forth it goes. Obviously, eventually, um, this this organism, Pesach, it just it, it couldn't take it anymore. You know, um, and eventually there was just like really really nasty depression um, and like totally shut down. You know, just going through the motions, um, sleeping a lot, um, very very disorienting, and you know. Funnily or ironically, the only thing that kept me a little bit energized was dipping into the things I wasn't supposed to be doing. Um, that part of me that was starting to expose itself to the world dipped in here and there, and mm. it, it kept me going. Um, but the part of me that was trying to bring this thing back in and stay religious, it's just like on its back, um, totally exhausted, and the only function it served was judging and shaming me um, for, 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 for the other things that were happening or for not being able to make it work. And, you know, started gravitating toward the, the boys and the yeshiva that, you know, weren't considered the most pious because I was, I guess, attracted to what they were up to. I wanted to be part of them or do the things that they were doing or be considered cool by them. Um, and started uh, gaining... I guess a negative reputation in that uh, paradigm, and eventually, after three years, you know, as I mentioned before, we would go home every half a year. The last time I went home, you know, after the three years, they they, they basically told my parents, "This this guy is not coming back." Um, so a de facto kicking out, right? So not walking in one day and say you're out, but I was out for spring break, and they said, "You ain't coming back." My parents begged and pleaded, um, but this thing ended. And I was about 17 and a half, close to 18. And I guess a new chapter began, like, what is happening with this guy? What are we doing with him? Um, it's, this thing has gotten so out of hand that the yeshiva doesn't want him back. We got real trouble on our hands. Well, you found yourself back in the USA, and your family didn't quite know what to do with you. So what happened next? I'm back in the States, I'm back in New York, I'm back in Brooklyn, in Bar Park, and nobody knows how to make sense out of this thing. Um, and, but there's sort of a few default options <laughs> that the, the Hasidic psychology goes into um, when somebody's getting kicked out of yeshiva. Maybe pair him up with a study partner, you know, and they just meet and study all day, maybe a part-time job, maybe we marry him off. There's a couple of limited options, alternatives. It's not ideal, right? The ideal would be that this guy stays in yeshiva and we don't have to be creative over here about what to do with him. But if we have to begrudgingly accept that option number one, um, which is the ideal is not panning out, um, we gotta go down the list. So we try different things, but nothing sustained. Um, and the final thing was work or marriage, or both. Um, so the first thing we did is they find they found me a job. Um, so through the community, you know, word of mouth, people knowing people, um, I started working in a I guess sort of sort of retail warehouse, um, helping 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 a business in the warehouse. And at the same time, um, I'm also they're also trying to marry me off, right? It's this is what you do. This is the the milestone, the rite of passage at this age, especially if somebody is struggling, um, and we're trying to do whatever we can so they don't fly away. Um, marriage is an anchor, or more like maybe handcuffs, because once you're married, you have children relatively quickly, and the more plugged in you are, the harder it is, the less the likelihood 
um, that this kid is is going to go what we call off the derech, um, that he's going to stray off the path. Mm. But that did not go well either, um, because I, I I'd already had some sort of bad reputation, um, and in the matchmaking business, your reputation is everything. Whether you're whether it's a true reputation or whether you're really good at marketing yourself and hiding all your skeletons, that's a different story. Um, but the bottom line is, I had a bad reputation, and whoever was pitched to me, right? So the matchmaker would call a girl's parents um, and be like, we know this guy, you know, um, this is his name, this is his sect, these are his parents. The answer was, across the board, we're not interested uh, because I, I sort of had a scarlet letter on me. And at the time, it was, there's a part of me that was very hurt by it. Um, th this is a major way of how you give yourself value. Um, if you're not you know, marriage quality, um, uh, or if you've been sort of lowered on, on the totem pole of yeah. being a prospect, it's, it, you're basically nothing. Um, so, but, but another part of me maybe was even relieved. In hindsight, all of me is relieved. Um, that, that, that did not happen. Um, and the reason why I'm sharing these things is just to point out the different t tactics um, that, that are employed to, to keep the person in. Um, instead of letting their mind wander and them being sort of self-directed and coming up with their own solutions. You know, and, and this thing went, went on for a few years. You know, this job, the other job, and trying to marry me off. And, and that wasn't working. And the, the thing is continuing, you know, the two different parts of me. The part of me that's sort of feeling relieved and kind of better about this new Pesach that's being created the one that works, the one that has friends that are a bit more immersed in society, the one that gets to do things that he didn't do before. But that, that religious part of me, um, that, that's not only cognitive, it's also embodied and it's all, all out through me, is also still alive, you know, really judging, really shaming, um, giving me these stories of like, this is just a phase, right? Um, eventually you'll try again um, and come back and do it perfectly. So this thing is still happening, just on a different level. Um, and yeah, I'm basically sort of still plugged into the community, changing a couple of things on the outside about how I look, but still trying to make it work. Um, people know that I'm not a good boy anymore. They can tell by my reputation, by the way I look, by the people I hang out with, um, by the fact that I'm working and not married. So. The, I'm sort of existing on, on the sort of periphery outcast layer um, of this society and still experiencing this major tug of war. This, when you go on like this, you know, it's not stagnant. Um, you either get help and, and get better or try to come up with healthy solutions or you start feeling worse um, and you start, you know, things become more sufferable and unfortunately went in that direction for me. Um, major substance abuse issues, you know, a lot of rupture and uh, discord between me and my family. Um, and when I think back, so much trauma um, in, in mm -hmm. all across. And this went on for years, um, I guess. Uh, and along the way, I guess, between 18 and 25, if you would look at me, that's when I sort of really left the community, right? I eventually got my own apartment. I eventually took off the, the head covering. I eventually cut off my side locks. It happened very slowly. Um, but, the, but the end point of this phase of my life, 23 to 25, was me leaving physically um, and geographically completely, but still experiencing this something on the inside a little bit in a big way. I still got to make a U-turn. I still feel guilty. Maybe I can make this work in a more modern way. There's still this thing going on inside. Yeah. Well, things really came to a head between the ages of 18 and 25 after a series of jobs in and around Brooklyn. Now, this was a dark period for you, but in the end, you found something that um, really turned things around. So take us through that journey. As I'm talking, the new things always emerge. I'm thinking back to the quote-unquote really dark phase over there and realizing that the only reason I made it through was because I had people who cared about me 
you know? So it was a really dark phase, but I also survived it. And there are reasons for it. So I hadn't quite found this sort of larger community or proof that people leave and make it. Um, I, my friends were more sort of on the periphery of outcasts, people who are still sort of hanging around the periphery of the community. But I had really close friends um, and even some family members who, who, were, who were supportive. And it wasn't enough, right? I, something different needed to, to build a new person or move this thing in a, a better direction. But I did make it through that period. Um, and I think that things would have, could have gone way worse, maybe even fatal, if I did not have some people um, who were sort of with me while I was going through this very, very miserable place. So eventually, things go way downhill, um, really, really heavy um, substance, chaotic substance use, um, really, really bad um, unresolved trauma, and really bad mental health issues. By bad, I don't mean like I was bad. That bad, I mean suffering. I'm really, really suffering. Kind of want to end it all. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't see, or I can't perceive a different version. I can't climb out of this hole. And I guess at this, what they call rock bottom, some something shifted. I can't keep a quite perfect chronology of events. Um, multiple things happening at the same time. Um, but at some point during this dark phase, I think I was about 24 or 25, I was always on the internet, watching YouTube videos, reading. I was, I guess, searching for things. Um, and eventually heard about this book um, called Unchosen. Um, it was written by a sociologist uh, called Dr. Hella Winston. And I had, I was living right around the corner from a library, what we call here the Brooklyn Public Library. And I decided to take it out. Um, I knew that it was, uh, I guess, a case study or a biography of the person who had left um, the exact same community. I, I even knew who they were. <laughs> I, weren't, I wasn't friends with them, but they, they were acquaintances, and I knew their family, and it felt very close, and I was very intrigued. So I take out this book from the library. It's called Unchosen, and I start reading it. You know, and all throughout the years, people would say things to me like, you know, you should get a GED. Um, you should, uh, maybe college is for you. You know, the, just talking, schmoozing, brainstorming. And it, it just flew right over my head. I didn't even know what it meant. Um, it, didn't, it didn't even feel like a real option. And, you know, it's like somebody saying, just move to, to, to North Korea. It was so bizarre. It didn't even register. But I read this book, and... The, the writer is narrating this, this man's story, and he is headed to this organization that's called Footsteps. Um, it's in the city, and it apparently helps um, people who are trying to navigate leaving um, Orthodox Judaism to help, to help them get a GED. That's why he's going there. Okay. As I'm reading this thing, something opened up, right? All of these comments that I'd heard over the years um, it's almost like I was hopeless before, and now there was some opening of something that could happen, right? This thing that I was told about, maybe it could happen, right? Here's this organization. I felt a little bit of agency or something, right? That th there is a possibility. Um, if, if I were left to my own devices, I don't, I don't even know what a GED is. I don't know what to do about it or how to get it. But if there is this place um, that helps people um, get, you know, pursue educational things. Um, and I'm also reading that they help in other ways. Hmm, okay. I, it didn't take long. It might have been the same day or within the next few days, I don't remember. Um, I, I sort of reached out to them and, and made an appointment for an intake. And my initial, I guess, goal was just to get the GED, trying to figure out the educational thing. Um, but it ended up I guess, being the portal um, or a very big contributor um, to where I am today. I, I go there and I get the GED thing started. Um, but as I'm starting to be part of Footsteps and a member and being helped in this educational way, other things begin to, to, to unfold around me, right? I'm meeting people. 
Um, I'm seeing different ways that Footsteps helps folks. And I'm also, you know, discovering and joining this Footsteps group. I'm discovering a larger community of folks who are doing or have done um, or are contemplating doing um, where I am at the moment. And they're not on the outskirts of the community, trying to make it work, not working, being considered an outcast. They're actually left. They're rebuilding, okay? They, they have imagined something new. Um, I, I, I like using this phrase. I, I have proof of concept of other possibilities. And a different thing started to happen. Um, and, but, but it wasn't clean or linear, you know, like this is a new chapter and everything's fine. The struggles were still there. Um, the, the unresolved trauma was still there. Um, a lot of things are happening at the same time. But this, so, so the part of me that's sort of really struggling and, you know, dealing with all of this stuff from the past hasn't really gotten the help it needs or been addressed. Um, so I'm building this new part of me. Um, but some, some part of me needs major, major help. Um, and it's, it's going to knock on my door one day in a very, very big way. And it did. You know, I continued having substance abuse issues. And I continued struggling immensely with my mental health. But somewhere along this line, I got the help I needed. Um, and I, I got the help I needed. I got the help I needed in trying to build a new life um, and a new thing started to happen, you know, leading me to where I am today. It, when we talk about these things, they sound so neat and like a chapter of a book. Um, but, but if you were sort of a little character on my shoulder riding along the entire way, this thing was absolutely chaotic. Um, it, it wasn't neat. It wasn't messy. It felt like I was walking around in clown shoes. You know, it's it looks very packaged and palatable from the outside, um, but it wasn't anything like that. It, it's good days, bad days, good parts, bad parts, um, triumph, despair, you know, 10 steps forward, two steps back. It, it was an extremely chaotic journey and somewhat still is because as I've discovered, um, being a human is quite messy. You know, the, the, the highlight reel is not the real thing. And I guess I say this a lot because I, I want people to know the truth of what it's like to go through this journey and that they're not doing it wrong, right? It, it feels extremely messy. And all you can do is just take the next step. Just try again tomorrow. Continue building. Um, it's all these tiny micro steps and experiences that accumulates into that highlight reel. Um, but it's extremely messy. It's an amazing journey you've taken, and I definitely want to commend you for your bravery and persistence. You'll soon be a fully practicing psychotherapist and taking on clients of your own, but until then, I'm sure you'll want to give some encouragement to anyone out there who may still be in an Orthodox religion and are experiencing doubts. So if there is anyone like that watching, what would you say to them right now? Thank you, Mark, for the wonderful questions and for what you just said, um, you know, the, the words bravery and, and stuff like that. Um, I do think it does take a lot of that. Um, but I also think it takes a village. So the first thing I'm going to say is that we need people. You know, we, we're social creatures and we need, we need a support system. It's really hard to navigate this thing alone. So if you are still in a community or if you're contemplating leaving it, or if you're on the way out, um, or if you've already left and rebuilding. There are so many different avenues or ways this can unfold, um, but I really, really encourage you to try to find people and places um, who, who can sort of be there to support you. You know, whether it's an organization that helps folks, whether it's a therapist outside of the community, um, whether it's a Facebook group, whether it's a Reddit, whatever it is, I really invite you to not go through this in isolation because you're not alone. Um, there are 
thousands, I'm being very conservative, millions maybe, um, who have and are experiencing the, the type of struggles, type of tension you're having um, with this journey, whatever that might look like for you. Do not have to be alone in it. There are a lot of us out there, um, and it's okay to need others. We're social animals. We need other people. You're not alone. Try to connect. Try to find support outside of yourself to complement what you're going through. The other thing I'm going to say is you are not crazy. Um, there is absolutely nothing inhuman or wrong or bizarre about what, what you're experiencing, whatever it may look like, whether you're, you're having doubts, whether you decided to leave, whether any part of you is not compatible with the way they tell you you're supposed to be, whatever it might be, it is human and normal and you are not crazy. Take your time. There is no rush. Something I learned really the hard way is that the longest way is often the fastest way. This thing takes time, maybe even a lifetime. Take your time, brick by brick. There is no rush. In order to build something sustainable or to move through this thing in a sustainable way, you got to take it very slowly. Um, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, there are a lot of different forces that have shaped us, and they can't just be deleted in a day. Life is a process, you know, just, just do your best. Slow down. And another thing I'll say is that where we grew up, you know, whatever flavor of religion or fundamentalism, more fundamentalism um, that you grew up with, the, there was a sort of idolization and worship, right? All the answers were outside of us. Um, everybody outside of us knows what to do. Um, let's worship and admire people, most like gods. Just be mindful of this thing, um, that all the advice, all the answers, everything that's sort of going to work for you is coming from an inside out place. You know, you know, nobody knows what it's like to be you. Um, the sort of thing that we've been trained that somebody outside of you, some authority has the answers. They're not you. The journey is to, I guess the goal is to build self-trust. Um, instead of looking for things outside of yourself to give you the manifesto. It's very easy um, to sort of take this way of thinking and relating to things and to the world um, and just slap it onto something else, right? So find somebody else who inspires you and sort of worship them. It's a very, very easy trap to fall back into. The idol that you're looking for, um, not in a sort of self-aggrandizing way, um, but the thing that you're looking for is inside of you. Um, nobody deserves your to be idolized by you. Um, nobody deserves to be worshipped by you. Um, because nobody deserves that kind of power over you. Um, learn to trust yourself. It's a lifelong journey. But the answers are more inside of you than outside. The goal is not to arrive anywhere, right? So it's not to replace one doctrine for another. The goal is to get more in touch with who you are, what works for you, what you find important, and to be a bit more flexible, right? To, that the world is not one-dimensional, right? There is no one ultimate truth, and that there is a way to experience the world in a bit of a more flexible, fluid way. Again, everything I'm saying sounds neat, and if that's not your goal, that's okay too. Um, I'm just sharing from my personal experience of what has helped me have a more human experience of my humanity. What does it mean to find values? Values is basically, what do I care about? Not what I've been told to care about. It's what do I care about? Um, and and how, what, what do I find important? What do I think is meaningful in life and what matters? And it's, very, it's sort of a, a long journey to figure that out, um, but I think there are really good clues um, in everything you've experienced, right? Everything that didn't work for you, everything that turns you off, everything that hurts you, has a clue about your needs and values in there. So again, <clears throat> take your time. The only reason why I'm talking like this is because I'm decades behind it, not because I'm better or smarter, 
more competent. Take your time. You're not crazy. Don't idolize or worship anyone. You have inner wisdom. The goal is not to arrive anywhere and to replace this religious way of thinking with another, with you know, adapting other beliefs in sort of a religious way. The goal is to be more, more flexible and to get in touch with the real you, you know, what your values are, what your needs are, and to pay attention to give your story its own meaning. Right, the meaning that we can adapt is those who leave are terrible human beings. Um, who, those who even consider it, are terrible human beings. Right, that that's their story. You have a right to give it your own packaging and your own meaning, um, and give it your own truth. I'm leaving for myself, not because I'm a bad person. Right, for example. So, be aware of this sort of shame narrative that we've been fed our entire life, um, that we've taken a wrong turn. According to them, you've taken a wrong turn. But according to you, maybe it is the right turn. And most importantly, you're not alone. You're not the first person or the last person or the most bizarre person for having these experiences, no matter what they say. There are thousands, maybe even millions of us out there, actively, always. Google it, look up online. Um, I bet Mark will include some resources. You're not alone. Join a community. Try to get help um, and take it a day at a time. I will leave links to your social media and to the Footsteps organization in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you very much indeed, Pesach, for coming on to Talk Beliefs. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. Um, I really appreciated the time you took to have this conversation with me, and I enjoyed talking to you. Remember, everyone. And this is so hard because of our conditioning that you have a human right to build a self-determined life. Welcome aboard.